Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Elliot Cohen. I'm the Dean of SICE. And it's uh, really a, a pleasure and an honor to uh, host this, which I think is the, when did we start this? Is this the 15th Bernstein Lecture, I think, that we've, uh, I guess? <laughs> right, right. That's. The, the faculty are always very helpful in pointing out the dean's mistakes. I've, uh, I've learned that in a few short months. Uh, so let me just begin by saying a few words about uh, the gentleman for whom this lecture series is named and then introducing our speaker. So Al Bernstein, uh, just to be upfront, was my boss at the Naval War College. And I followed him here to, uh, to Washington, D.C where he was setting up the first policy planning department in, uh, in the Pentagon. Uh, he was trained as a classical historian at uh, Cornell and at Oxford. Uh, he taught at Cornell in, the, uh, in ancient history for uh, a number of years, came to the Pentagon, set up the policy planning staff. From there, he went to become the founding director of the Institute uh, for National Security Studies at NDU. Uh, and then the founding director of the George C. Marshall Center uh, for European Security Studies in uh, garmisch partenkirchen uh, To the end of his all too short life, um, Al had come back to Washington and he was an adjunct professor here at SICE where he was a beloved teacher. Uh, and he founded a, a course which uh, was continued by my friend, uh, Dr. Abe Sholsky, and then later on by myself on Thucydides. Um, I have to say tonight we are particularly delighted to have Sandra Bernstein with us, as she has been, I believe, for all the, uh, uh, all the Bernstein lectures. Um, and I was, in fact, I was just thinking about Al literally last night, because I was giving a lecture, and it was, uh, the title of the lecture was Street Smarts versus Educated Judgment from Cleon to Donald Trump. <laughs> and uh, I remember when we were teaching together at the Naval War College, Al would do the Thucydides lectures and he would, he would channel Cleon. Cleon was the populist um, <clears throat> leader of the Athenian Demos and a major rival of Pericles, the great leader of Athens. And, and uh, Al had a unique way of making Cleon come alive on the stage. He would, he would kind of dial up New York, uh, dial down Oxford, uh, and he would channel Cleon, and he would get the students, the, the officers present, to understand Cleon's point of view. And of course, those of us who have uh, read uh, Peloponnesian War pretty closely know that <coughs> Thucydides is much more of a Pericles fan than a, a Cleon fan. What, what Al embodied <coughs> were, I think, the qualities that, that Seiss at its best embodies. That is to say, deep learning. Uh, he was a terrific ancient historian, but engagement with the world of affairs. And that was true for Al even when he was still at Cornell, uh, when he was doing consulting with the government, of course, in his career in public service, and then it comes full circle and he comes back here uh, and he's bringing that to his teaching of our students. And his, his course on Thucydides was filled with lessons and thoughts relevant to the world of today. And I thought as a way of honoring his memory, uh, there could be nothing better than having a lecture where we would either have very practically minded scholars or very, very thoughtful military people. Um, and we've kind of alternated one after the other, starting with Don Kagan uh, of Yale, who was Al's uh, advisor. Uh, we've had all kinds of people, Jim Mattis, Dave Petraeus, Dick Cohn. Uh, and tonight, we are delighted to welcome the 38th Commandant of the Marine Corps, General David Berger. Uh, just a quick introduction to General Berger. He is commanded at every level in the Marine Corps from a captain on up, from company command. He commanded Regimental Combat Team 8 in Fallujah in Iraq. 
Uh, he commanded 1st Marine Division forward in Afghanistan, Marine Forces Pacific, and of course now 38th Commandant. And with all of his achievements, I can affirm to you without any doubt whatsoever that his proudest moment of military service was when he graduated Johns Hopkins Sice in 2005 <laughs> as a Master of International Public Policy. And we are delighted and honored by your presence, Dave, so please take the stage. First of all, uh, it's not my fault I'm late. In the, uh, I, I asked the Dr. Cohen for forgiveness because in the spirit of civilian control of the military, I had a 1500 meeting with the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations and the Commander of PACOM and everybody else about the posture of our military in the Pacific. So if you can't solve that in an hour, right, I mean, that's an easy one. So. After an hour and a half, we're like, we're never going to get out of here. But it was, uh, <laughs> it was a great, all of you all would have loved to be in that room. Because it, obviously, it's an elevated discussion about the next 30, 40 years of where our military might be in the Pacific. And that's not an hour-long conversation, but just fascinating. 14 years ago, uh, I sat in here next to doc the doctor up front, Mara. Uh, since then, of course, you know, uh, she went on to get uh, her PhD. She served in, in national security for a number of different uh, secretaries of defense. Four or maybe more. I don't know how many. Five? Uh, she wore them all out, obviously. Uh, and now, of course, she's the director here. And for everyone, if you've worked around Mara, you know she doesn't sit still and she's not slowing down. And in the past 14 years, all I've managed to do is not get fired. Like, like uh, so you can draw your own, own conclusions. That's about all I have going uh, for me. I will start off by saying it is a huge honor to be with you all tonight, and I mean that uh, very sincerely. This, this lecture is traditionally given by a notable scholar or a distinguished uh, military leader. I'm not sure I'm either notable or distinguished. Uh, but I'll give, it, I'll give it a stab in the first half an hour and then see what's on your mind in the, in the second half. And uh, as, the, as Dr. Cohen alluded, I'm, I'm alluded to, I'm following a bunch of uh, real power hitters, so there's absolutely, I know, no pressure on me tonight at all. Uh, and in all honesty, though, uh, I absolutely give credit to Johns Hopkins publicly in the speaking that I do, and it's genuine because I think at that point in my career, this place uh, had a tremendous outsized impact on how I thought and the way I uh, looked at complex problems. And I, I attribute a large part of that to this place right here. So national security is what we're here to talk about. And here's my proposal to you is that I believe we are at the end of an era for our military force design and at the beginning of another. Now that may be, not be obvious to us as we sit in here this, this evening. Hopefully I'm gonna paint a, a portrait for you that describes it for you. But here it's, it's a little difficult to sense the, the wartime threat that normally we would see accompanying it's time to do a, a design of the force. But I would argue that the evidence uh, around us uh, and that the threats we face today drives us in that direction. I think it's imperative that we not only take note of the changing strategic environment, but also that you and I participate in it. We cannot just observe. And by participate, I mean evaluating the changing landscape, be willing to change accordingly, and think hard about how we can bend the strategic environment to favor our advantages. The 2018 National Defense Strategy reaffirms, of course, the Department of Defense's enduring mission, which is to provide combat credible military forces needed to deter war. Very basic, fundamental statement. And that should deterrence fail, the joint force must be prepared to win. Not just fight, but win. So that, that statement, very clear, uh, the mission of deterrence 
However, I would offer anything but simple. And to use uh, a, a dead Carl quote, everything in war, of course, is simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. And I would uh, perhaps offer to you the best illustration of complexity in deterrence uh, might be to ask, uh, what is deterrence in 2020 and beyond? What does it look like? How do you measure it? And how do you formulate a strategy around it? And I suspect that if we ask folks in this room, uh, we might get a lot of different answers. Generally, though, the, I think the theory of deterrence, the concept of deterrence is pretty straightforward. One party um, attempts to convince the other party uh, from taking any aggressive action. And, and that can be either denial, like denying the success of what you think you're going to try to do, or the risk of consequences. This is the theory of deterrence by punishment. For me, uh, the way that I think about it in my brain is basically three elements, three C's. You have to have the capability, uh, first of all, and that's got to be credible. You have to have the means to communicate both the capability and the willingness. So the capability, the, the ability to communicate it, and it's got to be credible. Now, while the logic, of course, for deterrence has been around for a long time, and theory has been taken apart nine ways to Sunday, I'm going to try to catch you up to today and how that might apply to where we are in the world around us and hopefully generate some discussion. And most, I would suppose, in this room have probably read uh, Schelling's uh, work. I think it's a seminal uh, description of deterrence. But since that time, of course, more folks have talked about it and more have written about it. And there are some today who will question whether that traditional theory of deterrence actually is still relevant in the post-Cold War era, when really we've been fighting uh, a terrorist, anti, uh, fighting terrorism for the past decade, and advanced conventional weapons now rival, to some, in some would argue, uh, nu nuclear or unconventional weapons. So really, the, this, this is one approach that the, the conventional approach to, to deterrence is outdated. Great debates to have, and they illuminate, I think, our perspectives. But for me, again, back to dust off the books on deterrence theory, try to tie them into national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Frame all of that in an era of great power competition. So if I, this is the process I'm going through now myself. So like any good, fairly good student of history, I look for what lessons are applicable and ask why. So that's what we're here about this evening, to think about, discuss how your military forces can accomplish that mission outlined in the, in the national defense strategy to deter war, and then if that fails, be prepared to win. I'll note uh, one note before uh, proceeding. I think deterrence, has, you have to lift deterrence up larger than from a military framework. In its purest sense, it is a whole-of-government approach. And you could make that problem even bigger to say deterrence is actually, in a large sense, either an alliance or a multinational effort. A uniformed officer, which I am, going to try to stay in my lane, so I will focus on the military instrument of power and how that contributes to deterrence. But I think, again, it's important to remember that the military alone, your military or any other, cannot achieve deterrence, this is my conclusion alone. It does require a whole of government strategy. A few years ago, um, three years ago, I was the commander of the Marine Forces in the Pacific, and there was a congressional delegation traveling through the Pacific on their way to Japan and Korea, and I used the map in my office in Hawaii there and sketched out three different time frames for them. And we were talking about what the military might look like in the future. This is their question. So I took the opportunity to use a map in a sort of a whiteboard way, talk about three time frames. And the first one I sketched on there was, begins about 1950, uh, ends about, not about, ends uh, on a date in 1991. The second time frame I sketched on there was from 1991 to about 2015, 2016 and then 2016 off to the right edge of the board. So 
my purpose in drawing that on the board and discussing that with them was I believe they are three different time frames with three different distinct approaches to competition. And then I tied that to design of the force, the military, the design of the military force, how we view deterrence. The first era I described for them uh, in the 1950 to 91, the Cold War era, of course, we all knew bipolar, we understood deterrence. Uh, there were people very, very good at deterrence. Everything was threat-based. We understood the threat, we knew who they were, we knew how they would fight, and the, cop, the, the whole concept of mutually assured destruction, of course, was uh, developed. That drove how we developed capabilities. And basically, we would seek a tit-for-tat escalation up a ladder, and that, would, that main, maintenance of parity was part of deterrence. And allies and partners and NATO was all part of that balance of power and part of deterrence. The second part, Second era, I would argue, much more difficult to get our brain around in terms of deterrence. And there was no great power competition from 91 till the mid 20 teens. Everything changed, of course, when the Soviet Union and our great power competitor goes away. We're now in a unipolar world. We enjoyed uncontested, all domain dominance where we chose, when we chose, all over the place. But in the intervening years, we used our military and our government to quell problems around the world below the threshold of great power competition because we didn't have a peer adversary. Those were the conflicts I deployed to in Iraq and Afghanistan. During that time, your Department of Defense shifted away from a threat-based model into a capabilities-based design. In other words, your military was developing the next best capability. We were our own bar. We had no driver, so, and we had the resources to do it, and we had a huge technological advantage, so our, we were measuring our rate of advancement against ourself. Capabilities-based force design. And that was hugely successful all the way through uh, mid-20s, 15s. At least it looked like it. Allies and partners were nice to have. We certainly brought them into the fold in Iraq and Afghanistan, but frankly, not critical. Nice to have. Then you get into the third era, which we are in right now. This is the rise of Russia and China, and we're back to great power competition. Now it's multipolar. We lift our head out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Two other nations have caught, made some ground up on us. While we were focusing on terrorism, other countries like China and Russia were not focused on terrorism. They were focused on us. We were the bar. So we're back in great power competition. We have peer competitors. We're in a multipolar world. We can no longer, this is my argument, we can no longer design the force based on our capabilities or a single threat. We have to count now for multiple high-level threats and develop not just the capabilities and not just the capacity, but also the concepts for how we're going to use our force. In other words, now it becomes a combination of threat-informed, capabilities-based force design. Threat-informed, capabilities-based. The military you need us to have 10 years from now has to factor both in. I believe, going forward. The allies and partners now become more important than they did the last 20 years, in fact, critical. Because my argument is the U.S. cannot do it alone. And even if theoretically we could, fiscally we probably could not. And uh, I I listened to some extracts from the uh, Australian Minister of Defense a week ago at the Hudson Institute, fascinating dialogue with her about deterrence and Australia's view of their role in the world. So those are the three different eras, different threat environments, uh, different approaches to deterrence. So now we're back in the era of great power competition, and that's where I started this discussion. And I said we're at the end of one era, beginning of another. And that's where I'd like to park for just a moment. 
Both the national security strategy and the national defense strategy emphasize, of course, the changing landscape. They beat the drum on a long-term, long-term strategic competition with great powers. Long-term meaning more than weeks, months, perhaps longer than years. This is, could be decades. And now, as a commandant of the Marine Corps, which means you're both a service chief and a joint chief, it's my role to man, train, and equip your Marine Corps. That's my Title X task. And to do that with a mission of deterrence, but be prepared to fight and win in an era of, in a framework of great power competition. And to be brutally honest, if we're going to assess ourselves, I, here's mine. We are not currently organized to do that. In fact, we're perfectly organized if Desert Shield, Desert Storm comes back our way. Uh, we are designed, in other words, for a competition behind us, not in front of us. And that's driving the Marine Corps to redesign our force. If we're going to deter, if we're going to have the same force that deters also shift to a warfighting stance and win, we're going to need a different Marine Corps. So our I think our central challenge then is to pick the brains of the people in the 1950s, 60s, 70s who really understood deterrence, try to figure out how do we measure it, how do we understand perceptions of an adversary, because this is what deterrence is all about. How do you actually capture the deterrence value of your military forces and the information part of that? How do you weave that all, stitch that all together? If that's the case, and that's what I, my premise is, then the next question for me is, if, if that's true, then what are the factors that drive change going forward? And in my mind, there's a, you could have 50 things to talk about here. I'm going to narrow it down to just a few. Just three. First, gray zone operations. And again, I'm looking forward into the, where the U.S. military has to operate in the Marine Corps, and I would say gray zone operations is a complicated topic. It's not as obvious to see. It's not as obvious to sense. Our adversaries clearly understand that. They would like to operate just below the threshold of kinetic uh, conflict, open conflict. Gray zone, the term, just below the threshold of conflict. You could look to Ukraine for, I think, a great case study in that, of course, where um, plain uniform people uh, in Ukraine operating. We, it took us a while to figure out what was going on. This is right below the threshold of conflict that then quickly gave them a leg up. It was a hostile takeover that took a while for us to understand what was actually going on. They're operatives, in other words. And you could, do, you could look out in the Pacific and see the same thing happen in a number of places out there. Economic or military. By blurring the lines, in other words, adversaries avoid our military strengths. They're not going to approach us in a symmetric fashion. And by avoiding our strengths, they actually erode our advantages. We should understand that. Back that up with things like predatory economics uh, and a very powerful messaging machine that doesn't have to be accurate. It's just got to have a loud volume on it. This becomes now coercive behavior over the long term, all the way into election tampering, mobilizing, mass perceptions. You know where that story goes. And you can see it. I saw it for two years in the Pacific firsthand. You go to a place like Saipan, looks like a great resort, and every casino is Chinese-owned. The money flowing into there is, clear, is so easy to track. This is soft power. This is another form of competition, right, for us. The problem is our military forces are built to handle a fight, a kinetic fight, not so much handle the gray zone. It's an area we haven't been in in a while. I would argue, though, that the Marine Corps has a history in gray zone competition, dating back to the OSS days and back further than that. This is uh, relearning for us in the Marine Corps, and I think we would have to focus on that. Second, I would say new war fighting domains. Number two area, different. Uh, when I came into the Marine Corps, there were three. 
land, air, and sea. Not very difficult to get your brain around. Add cyberspace, add space, now it's much more complicated. These are new domains for us to operate in. New vulnerabilities, but also new opportunities. The first three were physical. These are more cognitive, right, domains. This is, takes another level of understanding. I would say here we also lack decades of operational law. Uh, it will catch up eventually, but right now we don't have it. We have it in air, land, and sea. We know what that is, but we don't have it in cyberspace, and we don't have it in space. And operational law is sort of fundamental in international law to what we do. What is an act of war, in other words, in space? What is an act of war in cyberspace? It's difficult to define. But we have to think about all that. And, uh, of course, the fight is not going to take place totally in those domains, but it's all now part of a more complicated landscape. And you add in a third area, and again, you could go on and on. I'll just pick one, long-range precision fires. Character of warfare changes, of course. Nature, not so much, but the character certainly does. Today's weapons have much more longer range. Our sensor systems have much more longer range. The precision is greater. The lethality is greater. Artillery pieces, when I came in, 18 to 20 kilometers was great. Rockets a little bit further. Now we are, of course, much farther than that. You look at the Chinese weapon systems, the DF-21, the DF-26, we're talking very long range weapon systems in fairly high numbers. So the range rings stretch out farther and farther and farther. And our ability to collect, our ability to sense from satellite systems down to low Earth, Earth orbit all the way down to the terrestrial base, many more layers of sensing at a deeper depth. And they do too. So this sort of ubiquitous collection is, is not something that's been around for 40 years. Last part of this, uh, which we're going to have to wrestle with, all of that gave us so much situational awareness for senior commanders that we are now comfortable with it. We are going to be completely uncomfortable when they take it away. And any adversary is going to go after our networks on day one. They are this afternoon. And uh, I think the good part is your, your lower level junior commanders are going to be happy, disconnected from dad, and the senior ones who grew up with screens this big of every element, every raid, are going to be blind. And we're going to be very uncomfortable. I think it's perfect. It's great. Uh, so how do we design a force? If those are some characteristics going forward, how are we going to design the force? And if you have an answer for this, uh, I'd like to talk to you afterwards, sign you up for, give you an oath of office, you can become a Marine. Um, two points. And then uh, I'll draw to a close. Two points on designing the force. These are, these are areas I don't have answers to. These are areas I'm trying to take apart. First, the idea of a stand-in versus a stand-off force. If, if you accept that improved, longer-range precision weapons and sensors now stretch things out, it's becoming very difficult to fight on the inside and survive and not be detected. So there are some proponents of a standoff sort of a posture. We will just hold each other at bay with these very lethal long-range weapon systems. That's how you hide, protect assets at great distance. Problem is, uh, those don't hold terrain. Uh, they don't, it's a different aspect when you're talking about space and cyberspace, and it's almost impossible to hide, no matter how far back you go. There's a bubble, in other words, conventionally in the past of you're safe outside this area. That bubble doesn't exist any longer. It pushes us into another area. So how does it affect deterrence? If you have a stand-in and a stand-off sort of a framework, what does deterrence actually mean? Back to the deterrence by denial. If you are an inside stand-in force, in other words, you're denying them the freedom to operate in there, you vacate that, you open up a vacuum. This is the theory. Something I'm taking apart in my head. Um, I would say, and when you wrap in the, uh, just one other aspect, when you wrap in the allies and partners into that, 
there's a reassurance, assurance part of that in terms of deterrence where you have to be on the inside. Because if you move backwards, you just left them. They are on their own. Okay, not a great signal to send. Because you basically said we're more valuable than you are. We love you as a partner right up until. So I'm a proponent of you need both. You're going to need a stand-in and a standoff force. And your stand-in force has to be able to take a blow and survive and deliver it back again. Effective deterrence, in other words, my premise is, is a combination of both, but I think we have to figure out the ratio. <clears throat> Second part, pacing threat. Here's where I could really use some, some help, pacing threat. We're told what our pacing threats are, and we know what they are. Lately, in the past few months, I've been tackling the last three letters of pacing, I-N-G part. Here's what I mean. Pacing, in one framework, means they're here. That's our benchmark. If we just have a little better military, worry, we have an advantage game. Not so easy. We are both moving. This is going to be dynamic, perhaps, for decades. Now what I'm thinking of is, boy, it's a, like if, you're, if your comparison is sort of sports or something like that, it is harder to set the pace. You're breaking trail. You're making the mistakes. You're actually spending more money to stay in front. It's easier to draft. But we like being in front. We want to be in front. But it's expensive to stay in front. It's easier to draft, ride off of their research and development, their ideas, and then just snap up when you want to. But we don't like being behind. So now I'm wrestling with, as, our, as a nation, in this kind of era, are we willing to pay the price to stay in front? Or in some areas, do we decide to actually run astride or perhaps behind? Let the adversary spend the money, make the mistakes, if we can understand the risk. We're both, in other words, maneuvering against each other, both looking for an advantage. It's going to be temporal. The other side is going to counter. This will go on for a long period of time. The, the pacing, dynamic part of it, I'm wrestling with. I don't really have an answer. But it complicates things, of course, in terms of deterrence. Pacing, both of us moving. So those are sort of all the parts that I haven't solved. Uh, and we are redesigning the Marine Corps. I think uh, this is a great place probably more to stop. Uh, it's best to stop when you don't have the answers. You just pose all the problems and you just toss them out there. Uh, but the next part, fascinating for me. So uh, willing to take your questions and actually your criticisms and thoughts too. Okay, Mar. Well, thank you for that fantastic presentation. Um, we are so excited to welcome you back here. It's hard to believe that 15 years ago, we were sitting there talking about our time at Tulane, and somehow you are here doing all sorts of fantastic things, and I apparently just can't leave this place. Um, <laughs> so before uh, I ask you a, a, a couple questions and then turn to the audience, we've got Mike set up. Um, I need to actually ask you to rewind to your time back here 15 years ago. You said it had an outsized effect in how you thought about problems. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? When I came here, I, uh, Iraq was kind of fresh in my mind, trying to get my brain around uh, where we were and where I was as a lieutenant colonel colonel. Uh, I had come out of command in Haiti, uh, where we deployed for a year to try to resolve problems there, and things were on a very small scale. And I knew when I left here, I was headed to Fallujah. So for me, what this, thing, what this place did for me is expand my brain to think about more than the military tactical aspects of what I was doing. And frankly, dispel about 50 myths. Because coming here, I've been very frustrated with people that we have to work with in other countries that want our help and all the nonprofits, and they're just a pain in the keister, right? Mm -hmm. Wish they could just get out of our way. And then you come here and you learn that actually, those people know how to operate in countries. They get there faster, they have connections, they come in with a driver and $20 and off they're working. And we would still be planning back in the Pentagon for another three weeks. So it dispelled a lot of myths for me, really helped me going into both Iraq and Afghanistan. Just the whole of government, the rest of the picture, 
just blew it up for me. Great. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so you wrote this planning guidance. Mm. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working on planning guidance, and I've never touched one that is articulate and thoughtful as the one you put out. I think you have set a new bar for what strategic guidance looks like coming out of the Pentagon. So I want to ask you a question. I want to start by quoting two great men. The first is General Dave Berger, who says, force design is my number one priority, and it's not right. And then there's this fellow, Winston Churchill, who says, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally assess the results. So my question is this. You have a beautiful strategy. How are you actually going to bring it to life and implement it? If we invite you back here four years from now, what will you say that has actually happened with it? Yeah. Um, practically speaking, the hard part will be um, divesting, getting rid of certain things that the Marine Corps has accumulated over the past 40, 50, 60 years completely, reshaping ourselves into a naval force that I believe our country needs. So the Marine Corps we're going to will look radic very, very radically different than what we have right now, and that's going to not be an easy lift, fiscally or emotionally or anything else. So it's my... The way I reach that conclusion is our annual process of sort of making adjustments of our force was just going to put a bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. gap between what we are capable of doing and what the, what the nation needs us to do. So I think convincing our leaders and our alumni, retired Marines, that we have to get rid of that, we're going to need some of that new stuff, and we're going to operate as a naval force again. That's the shift we must make. And do you think you'll get to keep the funds from choosing those losers? And where do you see the Navy leadership in terms of this idea of kind of reunifying? I think as far as keep the funds, that's what service chiefs work hard to do. We spend a lot of time over on the Hill. That's a new part for me, uh, but I have quickly begun to understand that's a big part. If, you can't, if they can't understand it, they can't support it. So our job is to break it into, into simple parts that they can, they can wrap their brain around and explain to them. We're gonna, we're gonna save $2 billion over here. I'm gonna need to keep a fair portion of that to put it into here. And in the end, your Marine Corps will be able to do this, uh, and that's why you can't just take all that money, or else we're just a smaller Marine Corps. Terrific. Not a good one. As far as the Navy, I think um, the new CNO, Admiral Gilday, uh, I had a head start on him. Uh, he didn't have the three, four, five months of thinking time that I did. Uh, but we both see the world largely the same. The Indo-Pacific is a big challenge. It's always been an air and maritime theater. You need a very strong and capable uh, naval force, expeditionary force to do that. Great. All right, let me ask one more question, and then I'll turn to the audience. Students, uh, I'm going to lo be looking to all of you in particular, so don't, don't be shy. Uh, there's no contribution grades here. Uh, <laughs> um, last question. So obviously, you are in charge of the force that is the youngest and has the highest turnover. Yeah. And so in some ways, it seems like pushing this change may be potentially easier than it would be if you were the chief of a different service. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about changing human capital and talent management systems and, and kind of what you're looking for in those future Marines? We have to fundamentally change the way we, not fundamentally, but we have to make some fairly significant changes in the way we recruit and retain. Right now, if you were a high school student, Mar, and we, you were talking to us about coming into the Marine Corps, we would give you a baseline test. We'd send you off for a physical, and we'd do your background check to make sure you're not too much of a criminal, right? A little bit of a criminal is fine. Okay, a little bit, of, little, little bit is okay. <laughs> the parking tickets on Massachusetts Avenue, fine. Uh, what we need to do is w more in line with the way Special Operations uh, Command does it in terms of assessing the whole person cognitively and in more in depth, the resilience, in other words, Try to capture in more ways than we can right now, and there are great methods for doing this, what it is we're actually getting from society. Because mm -hmm. that determines what we can transform it into and how long it'll go down the road, that, that man or woman will go down the road with us. 
retention. Um, money isn't going to solve, just throwing money uh, in terms of bonuses or extra pay is not going to solve all problems. People come into the Marine Corps because it's different. Mm -hmm. They want to challenge. Uh, they want to challenge themselves. I think to keep them, uh, we have to be a little more flexible in the way that we manage our manpower. We're going to slow down promotions a little bit on the enlisted side because we were promoting too fast. And in, in each grade, those in the military know you need, you need experience to make the decisions appropriate for a sergeant. So we're going to, we're going to, and on the one hand, we're going to slow promotions a little bit. On the other hand, we're going to delegate authority down to lower levels to keep the people they think they need to keep. Because right now, all of that authority is in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Who knows better than the colonel who's down there with the Marine? If they think that's the right one, then keep them. And usually, lastly, I would tell you another change we're going to start this year is if this was the fourth year of your contract, then we would talk to you about, hey, do you want to stay in the Marine Corps? Now we'll do that in the third year. If you're ready, if you think this is something you want to do, and we're, why would we wait until the fourth mm -hmm. year? So we're making some pretty basic, some pretty significant changes. We have to. Absolutely. That is great to hear. All right, let's start. Uh, and when I call on you, please introduce yourself. Mm. Even better. Perfect. Uh, we have a student right up here, uh, Dennis, right here. He's getting attacked by multiple mics. Hey, I'm a fan of multiple bikes. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. A little too loud. Hi. My name is Dennis Murphy. I'm a second year Strat student. Thank yeah. you very much for coming to talk with us. So we've been hearing a lot about the future and how we're going to be prepared for current, the conflicts that will be coming down the road in five, ten years. Oh, what spaces do you think the Marine Corps might not want to get involved in in the future? Because I know there are going to be some conflicts that we're moving away from. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the realm of irregular warfare and counterinsurgency. Thank you very much. Um, my answer probably is going to be more complicated than your question. <laughs> Here's why. Um, what I have learned over the past uh, five months is there's two different roles. As I, I skim past by it pretty quickly, but on the one hand, I view things through what's best for the Marine Corps. I'm the commandant of the Marine Corps. But in another complete lens, I'm a joint chief. Service doesn't matter. This is all about best military advice to the secretary and the president. So the first part is it could be two different answers. What's best for the Marine Corps, but also from a joint chief's perspective, what's best military advice for the nation? Here's the challenge, and it's not a new one. We, the military has constantly tried to look down the road and reshape itself and move in a direction, and it gets tugged back into the moment, back into Syria, right? This pulls us back into the moment, pulls our forces back into the moment, and our resources back into the moment. So in a perfect world, we would, we would lower our uh, level of presence in the Middle East, shift it, uh, in another direction, but the real world has, gives us a problem with that. Iran gives us a problem with that. So the tension, that tension between the near term, managing the force for this afternoon sort of crisis, is, is, the, is the tension between that and modernizing, posturing the force for the future, for the Marine Corps. We must become a naval force, back to our roots. Why no other force does that? It is what the nation needs. Not because I uniquely love the Navy, it's because that's what our nation needs. I'm completely practical. This is what we must do. We must do less of uh, large formations in the Middle East landbound. We'll do whatever the nation needs us to do when we're told. Given a choice, back out of the missions that other forces can do, focus on the missions, the role that the nation needs us to do into the future. But I am practical. We will always get tugged back into this afternoon and tomorrow morning. Professor McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, sir, for being here. Sir. We, uh, had a session this uh, week with the former 
Se uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, and as you know, he's uh, well schooled in technology. Yes. He, he talked a lot about autonomous weapons. Right. I wonder how does the Marine Corps feel about autonomous weapons? The idea. I mean, he painted a picture of an auto a robotic soldier, for example. Right. Uh, how does the Marine Corps feel about that broad uh, issue? Two parts to that, sir. First, uh, my learning over the past year and a half is that our whole bureaucracy resists that because we're, we're, uh, we're built on a system where she has a program of record for whatever that machine is. I have a program of record. And my job is to get more resources for my truck or her plane. Mm -hmm. And they're all manned. So the, the whole bureaucracy is not designed to resist that, but it's going to slow it down. So my learning is we have to set actually artificial goals to accelerate because the, the institution will cause enough friction in there to slow us, slow us down. We must get into robotics and, and, and autonomy both for several reasons. One, it saves lives. Two, logistically. If you have 100 vehicles that are manned today, but I could have 300 and part of them are unmanned, why would I not want that? Those things don't get tired. Uh, they're a lot cheaper, right? Uh, so we have to go in that direction. I, I understand the philosophical concerns about decision making. Absolutely has to be part of the discussion down the road. But. Uh, We'll take a very basic one right now. We have uh, forces, of course, around the world, as does everybody else. Here's where I want to be. I want the forces that are in northern Syria right now uh, with their armored vehicles. And that armored vehicle has an alternator on it that's got like 300 hours or whatever. I want that alternator sensing back through the system, hey, I need to be replaced within 50 hours. And then we're shipping another alternator to it. Nobody knows any of this is happening. But right now, you're going to wait till that truck breaks. And then you're going to manually type in, I need an alternator. This is our system. We need the autonomy to think faster, move things, make the basic decisions. When it gets to a kill chain sort of sense to shoot, sort of close the kill chain, I'm comfortable right now that we know where the human is in that loop. But in other areas, from explosive ordnance disposal to logistics, we must go there and go fast. Have to. One more, sensing. We're working on systems right now on the water that unman vessels that go out and from there have other unmanned systems that sense. Boy, this, is, this makes a lot of sense, right? Or put back in my reconnaissance world, why would the first person to get on the beach have to be a person? Should not be. We want to find the mines, find the lanes, get in shore, get deep, then we'll bring the people in. But we're going to have to push. We're going to have to put our shoulder into it because the system just resists it. Thank you for that, Paula. Thank you, sir. My name is Paul. I'm a second year student. So my question is, you've talked a lot about deterrence, and deterrence is influenced partly by fear and by what the adversary can do. And in my view, the rhetoric coming out of the de Defense Department right now is that you're extremely, you're looking forward to see what two specific adversaries can do, and you're doing everything in your power to be ready in case um, something might happen, um, like changing the force, like innovating in really new ways. Do you not think that that could lead potentially for your adversaries to be ready and lead to a conflict that maybe mm. need not happen and will only happen because of the fear that what yeah. you're doing could lead to it? That topic is, a, is an awesome one to unpack. To get to that answer though, and we, we're no way we're gonna do it today, but, but Marla can, can, can take you there. You have to understand the different levels of communication that happen every day. Outwardly, overtly, our messaging may be X. Below that, you should just know from inside the chain of command that's out in the Pacific 
through the Pentagon. People are talking laterally to our Chinese counterparts and to others. There's, there's 15 layers of conversation happening at the same time. Now, the magic of synchronizing that, tough, really hard. Theoretically, your premise is, could we actually be inviting conflict? That's it. That's a great discussion to have. The challenge is, for the military, we can't not be ready. Now, how much we crank up the volume, which is part of your question, great point of discussion. Because it's all about what they perceive, not what we're broadcasting. How do they understand that to be? And the same for us, right? Same for us. Four years ago, when the China um, created a series of artificial features in the South China Sea, we were trying to, what are they doing that for? They communicate to us it's for peaceful means. Now there are runways and hangars and military systems there. This is all about one side broadcast and the other side. What do, what do we perceive? Your, top, your question is a fantastic one. We have to be careful about that. Frankly, last part, and I'll just attribute that to this school, we don't understand China like we need to. At, at, sec, at, at Dr. Cohen's council when I got here, because you can kind of have an, under to, you know, an understudy sort of topic below um, your major, he, he said, you might think about China, which I did. We, we are way behind in understanding. And, and you're not, I, I think I'm going to study till the day I die, and I'll half understand it. But we got to work on it. Terrific. Shay. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I'm a second year strat student. Uh, a professor of ours once said that the problem in the, at DOD is that all the uh, civilians are Kohenian and all the officers are Huntingtonians, present company excluded. And uh, right now we have a lot of uh, vacancies in the DOD. We have an ambitious plan, but we don't have a undersecretary for personal readiness and personnel. How does this affect the unequal yeah. dialogue, and how does it affect your mission? It does have an impact. Uh, it's better now than it was a year ago, but two, two parts, two factors there. One is the, by law, eliminating a lot of the senior uniform people in, in, the, in the Secretary of Defense's staff. So there's no more generals or admirals on their staff, other than working for the secretary and the deputy secretary. Where there used to be in all those areas, there would be one of us, kind of the liaison, intermediary, gone. Combine that with the vacancies you speak of complicates things a lot. Because now the second, third, fourth tier, tier people are making, making decisions. They don't have the repetitions. They don't have the experience. I suppose you could take one or two approaches. Try to talk over their head, push them aside, or, or slow down a little bit. You may have to repeat things, uh, not dumb it down, but it's a different conversation. She, she served for five secretaries of defense. I can start the conversation at a certain level. If her billet, her position is open, then somebody below is fleeting up, right? A little less experience, not quite as broad a portfolio. I have to adjust. I have to adjust. One last part of that. I don't really know what to make of this. You didn't ask it, but it's something I'm wrestling with in my brain. The answer to your question also changes over the period of an administration. We're in the last 12 months. It's a different environment. I don't know, better, worse, it's just very different, if you, if you know what I mean. I don't even know what I mean. It's just in the <laughs> last. But it is definitely different. <laughs> that, that is fantastic. And for the strategy and policy students, we'll be doing civil relations in a week or so. Oh, there we go. Remember these brilliant insights from, uh, from General Berger. So I think we've got time for one or two uh, final questions. Yes, Arisha. My name is Arisha. I'm a first year strategic studies student. Um, yes. So a question that I had relating to China was, how does the United States combat China's uh, various investments in South and Southeast Asia in their ports as well as naval bases, and how do we maintain primacy in the Indo-Pacific? 
If you have the answer to that. <laughs> I'm hearing lots of homework assignments. <laughs> Here's uh, your framing a problem, of course. I mean, that's why you asked it. The answer to your problem is clearly not a military answer, right? This is whole of government. We have to understand great power competition is not a military versus military correlation of forces. We know the numerical. No, that's not what we're talking about. It's not what you're asking about. You're talking about influence. And other nations getting caught in between two elephants, right? Money talks. This is where diplomacy, I think, has to step up in a big way. Our economic uh, investment, our economic footprint has to match it. Uh, but we have to understand it doesn't have to be a dollar for dollar. We, but we have to, what we've got to do as a nation is pull together a coherent picture of what great power competition means, weave in all the elements that you're speaking of. We're at a disadvantage in one aspect, right? We're a democracy. They're a whole of government in a person. We're a whole of government in at least three parts on a good day, right? Now, that doesn't mean we're at a disadvantage in other areas. It does mean we have to work harder. It means we got to talk more as an interagency to get after what you're talking about. How are we going to counter them in Palau, Papua New Guinea, Saipan, you pick the place. Where are we going to invest? How much of each part of our government pushes forward? We've got to wrestle with that. We haven't needed to in the past because we didn't have a peer competitor. Didn't push us. We're being pushed now. One thing is clear, though. In, in the, I think in the strategic environment we're in now, if you void a space, they will move in. Leave the door open, they're in. They will make all kind of process, promises, build a port, build an airfield, and then four years later, they will hold the title. That's kind of what you're alluding to. But if you're the elected official there, how can you say no? Right? They offered to rebuild my airport. How can I be that guy who said, that gal who said no? Take the near-term money. This is on a higher level. That's what you're asking about. All right. I think we have our last question up here. Thank you for being here this evening. Keith Bickle, I'm an alum, did my dissertation on the Marine Corps under Elliott. So my question for you is this. I hear you say you want to be naval based, and having read through all of the ops plans for amphibious warfare, uh, you know, I've got these visions of a high-tech version of amphibious warfare, and I don't know if that's what you mean. I was wondering if you could unpack the naval basis of uh, how, what you're thinking, and have you thought about maybe operating or owning a different domain, which might be space, or it might be speed. You're the force that can get there instantly, dispersed. You have a history of being able to operate dispersed, right. given today's lethality, something other, other forces own. It is clearly not the historical, what, what you bring to your mind when you think of Tarawa or Iwo Jima or Inchon, it's not that flavor of amphibious operations. It is, to your point, sir, very distributed. Uh, I still think it's naval. I think it's uh, Navy plus Marine Corps, not Marine Corps going its own. Why? Because everything is relative relative to your competition. We have to improve in areas they can't, or, or we have a temporal advantage here. They cannot match us as a Navy Marine Corps team. We need to leverage that. They, we, can't, we can operate much more distributed than they can. We can challenge them. We can give them a real problem in a, inside the first island chain. Oh, you name the theater. This is a unique. United States capability. We, have, we need to leverage it. That is a margin of advantage. And I'm not talking, just one last comment. Some have asked me and asked the CNO, the Chief of Naval Operations, you talk about this, about operating distributed. And they immediately jump to the, to the uh, reference of that's in order to survive, right? And my response is no. You're distributing, you're spreading out so that you can pose a dilemma for an adversary from multiple directions. 
you come in like this, he can concentrate all of his collection, all of his focus in this narrow cone. No, we are going to spread out so that we're going to pose him a big problem. The survivability is a byproduct of that. But we're spreading out for a reason, so that we can have positional advantage when we need it. In my, I believe it's as a naval force, though. There is some huge, huge advantage to a sovereign vessel. It's your own little piece of America that you can move 300 miles in a day. It's amazing. So please join me in thanking the tremendous General Dave Berger.